Just interrupting our talking, okay. So here we go. He said it's time for the study. So anyways, we're just having fun here and yep. and uh, talking about Friday night plans. I hope you got some Friday night plans, even if they're just to stay home and enjoy the beauty outside. Unless you're getting lots of rain like we are. Yeah. <laughs> even that has its own beauty. Well, well we need some rain now and then. I mean, if you don't get any mm -hmm. rain, then... Yeah, I notice our grass is looking yeah. kind of green like the <laughs> in Washington, you know, <laughs> state of Washington. It, there it's, uh, we go and our daughter and son-in-law and eight grandkids are there. And so we uh, we love going there and seeing it because it's, it's kind of considered a rainforest. So it's extremely green. Kind of? It is. Well, it is considered a rainforest. <laughs> yes. It anyway, is. it's amazing because our grass, because of this rain we've had lately, has turned that kind of green. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of awesome Spring to see. Spring green. We've yeah. had that much rain. Spring green, mm -hmm. I think even more than that, and so it's it's kind of nice. So, but I don't want it to keep raining. You know, we were going to be out on the lake tonight. You would have seen wa water and waves and everything else. Maybe you someone jumping off the boat, but it's raining. Well, we got a storm going about on. Jumping off a boat and swimming and stuff when we're having a Bible. Story. Anyway, so we <laughs> we do have a storm going on. We really decided it wasn't a good idea to go out on a pontoon boat in the rain. Well, in rain maybe, but the storm, no, definitely not. So anyway, so we're here uh, for the Bible study again, uh, which hopefully you'll see us most Wednesdays. Every once in a while, we, you know, if we're going to be out of town or something, we might cancel. But other than that, we're here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we appreciate all of you that tune in. I know there's quite a few of you that do that. We would love to know where we're, where we're uh, reaching, you know, so we'd love to know who we're, who we're seeing. And so, you know, if you can just put a simple little comment on there from blah, blah, you know, I don't even know who you are. It doesn't matter. From blah, blah. Yeah, we just want blah, to know blah. if you're from blah, blah, or <laughs> rah, rah, or That's uh -huh. B-L-A-H, B-L-A-H. <laughs> All right, Pastor Dave. So, no, give us first name. You don't have to give a last name if you don't yeah. want to. Just uh, just something to I, let us know you're out there. Yeah. So, I mean, we see the numbers when we're of uh, those who are following but it's not quite the same it's not quite the same no yeah. but if you ever need um books or pamphlets on um holy spirit on yeah. salvation on speaking in tongues um we've got quite a few pamphlets and things around so yeah. there's a specific subject you're dealing with do let us know in this day and age where there's a lot of fear going on even more so now there you know, they couldn't leave us alone too long. You know, we, when everything got, got kind of just fell, you know, fell off for a while, and there were no restrictions. I said, if folks don't get too excited, it's not going to last long, and it didn't. It went about two months, and now they're going back to trying to get everything the way it was. And I don't think it's going to go as easy. But people have a lot of fear. If you got some fear, don't feel, you know, feel free to call me. You know, I had somebody call me today. You know, and and we prayed with her, mm -hmm. but. I have no problem just dropping what I'm doing and praying with you and helping you get through whatever you might be going through. It's not a cliche to say that fear is the opposite of faith. It is a fact. It is a fact. And you can't stand in faith if you're being, if you're struggling with fear. I don't care what the fear is. You will never find anywhere in the Word of God where fear has more authority than God does. Here's a really good way not to get into fear. Turn the television off. <laughs> it actually helps a lot. <laughs> you and, don't and need to watch that news. It's most of it's fake anyway. Don't watch it. Don't listen to it. Then you won't have any fear. <laughs> it, it has a lot to do too with who you surround yourself with. If you're surrounding yourself with people that are very negative and very fearful, you're going to fight it harder. Yes, Even are. if you um, aren't trying to give in to it. You will fight it harder. You don't need to do that. So even if they're family, just tell them change the subject. Yep. Don't pretend that you got the remote control in your hand and change the subject. <laughs> I was telling somebody the other day, maybe today, I don't know. But you know these these people that that believe everything they hear have no problem telling you all about it. You know, but if we say what we hear, oh no 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 no, you can't talk about that. That's hate speech. Blah blah. blah. I mean, give me a break. I mean, <laughs> I want so badly to share with people at work why they don't have to accept this virus or any virus. And ever. Ever. And they just want to tell me why I have to get it. <laughs> I don't have to get it. No. 
Yeah. God's word says I don't have to. Yeah. And it starts with believing his word and standing on it. You know, that's why in other countries that you see a lot more miracles because mm -hmm. they don't think they have to get it. And they don't have doctors and so on, so they don't want to get it. And, you know, they don't go run around in fear either. They just live their lives. And I think that is a reason people give in to it easier in America because we can go to the doctor. The doctor will make us all better. Yeah. Rather than waiting for uh, or trusting in God to make you all better, mm -hmm. people do. You know, they think doctors can more so. But, you know, when, when a symptom starts coming at me, my first scripture, my first go-to scripture, and I listen to lots of them, but the first go-to scripture is Romans eight eleven. It says, if the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead uh, dwells in you, yeah. then that same spirit that rose Jesus will also quicken or make alive or make well your yes. mortal flesh. Amen. Hey, I like that. And so, man, I, I use that, and that's my rhema word, and it works quick. It works quick. Mm -hmm. Any symptom may have been there, it leaves right away. And if things, you know, getting a little bit worse, you know, I, I, the symptoms aren't leaving as quick, we turn on Kenneth Hagin, Healing Scriptures. He reads all the healing scriptures in the Bible. And then he walks you through a um, prayer at the end. I'm going to call it a prayer. It's almost, it's a prayer, but it's kind of a commanding uh, things in a proper order. Yep. And um, it's very, very good. It's real good. Yeah. Very, almost no teaching in it. It's it's primarily just scriptures. A lot of times that night we'll turn it on and mm -hmm. go to sleep. Yeah. And you say, well, if you go to sleep, you're sure not hearing it. It's it's on YouTube on your phone. You can find it on YouTube. But I I'll turn it on, turn it low, so I'm hearing it, but not real loud. And uh, I I fall asleep to it. <clears throat> but my spirit is hearing it. You okay. know what? Your spirit does not go to sleep. Uh, you may not have known that, but it doesn't sleep. You know, God doesn't sleep. When he said he rested on the seventh day, it doesn't mean he took a nap for a day. <clears throat> he just rested from his work. And you tried building a world. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. how you get. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but it, the scriptures work. If you let the word of God get inside of you, the sickness that's inside of you will leave because light and darkness cannot dwell together. Yeah. And sickness is darkness. Healing is light. The word is light. So, I mean, that's just something you need to know and understand because God is still on the throne. He still heals. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. forever. And Jesus, uh, and Paul said that Jesus went about healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. How many? How many was that? Oh, oh. <laughs> a mighty powerful. And you know why it was all? Because he didn't turn anybody away. Because most people today think that you know, yeah, healing is almost like a lottery. You know, only one in a million people get healed or something. Well, that's not true. It doesn't have to be true anyway. It might be because people don't believe they're going to get it, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit tonight. Uh, oh, a couple of years ago when we started this, we, we talked about different uh, generals of the faith and some of their miracles that took place. We're going to do that tonight with R.W. Schombach. And uh, this is a pretty awesome book. He wrote this himself because he actually started his ministry in 1950. That's not that far away, folks. I, mean, I was born in 55, and I feel pretty young. So, And I'm still in the ministry. So anyway, he started his ministry. In, in, uh, in case you didn't catch the title, it's Miracles... Eyewitness to the Miraculous. Yes, I'll put it up here. Uh, so Reverend it. Schambach. Reverend Schambach. Who spells his name? Schambach is spelled S-C-H-A-M-B-A-C-H. -A -A there you go. R.W. Schambach. <clears throat> okay, and go ahead. Anyway, so we're gonna, I'm going to read some stories, and then we're going to talk about these stories afterwards. And uh, his wife wrote the introduction, saying, I, I am testifying that all these miracles that he's about to tell you about in this book actually happened. I was right beside him for most of them. Not all of them, but most so of them. So I guess you ought to have me um, write the forwards in your book. I think so. <laughs> I think so. I can testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read some stories, and uh, hopefully my voice will hold out. I've done them. I'll hand it over to Pastor Cindy here. And then we'll talk about some of the things. See how I am. I'm back up. <laughs> we'll talk about some of these things. Now, these things that he did... Aren't, you know, people say, well, that happened way back when, you know, and, and it was a long time ago. 
Well, maybe it was a long time ago, maybe it wasn't. But here's the thing, it still happens today. Mm-hmm. It can. However, for most of these things, most of these things happen in meetings, in services. And it didn't happen out online because there was no online thing at the time. Mm-hmm. You might get a healing online. You do a lot better if you're right in the service. So if God why, gives me why the word. Would that be? Well, God, God may, you know, all of a sudden interrupt me and say that person down in the fourth row, you know, has this problem, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if God speaks and says and gives me a word of knowledge for someone that, you know, for instance, you know, has, has a, um, you know, a problem with their, a kidney or something, you, know, you probably wouldn't have told me. You know, all I was looking for. Was the anointing? Oh, the anointing. <laughs> the anointing is far different when you're in person. Yeah. Than the, you can go ahead and explain that. I just wanted to bring that out. But anyway, yeah. if, you know, if I bring, if I, if I speak that word out, you're going to know God wants to heal you, right? And you're going to get healed. Um, but there is a thing called an anointing, and it kind of shows up. The anointing of God, the Holy Spirit, shows up when we start services. And corporate the anointing, prayer is corporate worship. Corporate prayer is um, dynamic. And where the anointing is, it breaks mm-hmm. every yoke. Right. Bre- and yokes are, are things that are holding you back, like sickness mm-hmm. or disease or whatever it might be. You know, so when you're in here present, when you're present in the service, you get miracles, signs, and wonders. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily get them too much watching it on TV. You can watch the miracles, signs, and wonders, but don't you want to participate in them? Don't you want to have one yourself? Anyway, I'll get past that, and we're going to start reading here. <laughs> All right, I'm glad you're, you're watching. So, when, This is Schambach talking, not me. Uh, so R.W. Schambach says, When I pastored a church in the early 1950s, we sponsored a missionary in India by paying his salary. He spent 30 years there, 30 long years. On one occasion, he told me something that discouraged me from even supporting him. He said he had spent 30 years in India and had never seen one Mohammedan, Mohammedan, whatever, born again, people that believed in Muhammad. He says, and I said, what kind of investment am I making? We're investing money and keeping that man in India to preach the gospel and not one soul has been saved. It is time to rearrange our priorities. So I went to India to find out what was going on. It's kind of nice. Don't don't be always going to zip over to India and find out what's going on. (laughs) Today is not as easy to go to India as it was. I have some people, some Indian uh, pastors over there that want me to come over for for some meetings. But flying right now is a little difficult. (laughs) It's just interesting. Yeah, so. But anyway, uh, so he flew on over to, to India. It says, the first time I visited India in 1956, I preached to 50,000 people. I visited all the marketplaces. I saw beggars, blind folk, and people who couldn't walk. I have never seen so many sick people. India is one of the poorest nations in the world with so many homeless, penniless people. We invested thousands of dollars to build a structure that protected the people from the hot sun so they could hear the gospel. On that opening day, I was so thrilled. I preached for two hours, and my interpreter translated for two hours, for a total of four hours. They wanted me to go on. When I gave the altar call, I was so disappointed. I had preached to 50,000 people, and not one soul had come to accept Jesus. Wow. My mind went back to what the missionary told me. And I said, oh, Lord. But I knew God called us to do more than just preach the word. He called us to demonstrate the gospel. Although no one came forward to accept Christ, and the crowd was obviously ready for the benediction, I said, I am not done now. God says that signs follow his word. I did what God called me to do. Now I'm going to let God do what he said he was going to do. So I invited three people from the audience to come forward. They were beggars. I knew who they were. One was blind, one was deaf, and one was dumb. And the other was a crippled woman. One was deaf and dumb, and the other was a crippled woman who had never walked upright. She walked in a horizontal position on the heels of her feet and the heels of her hands. She had a disease that hindered her from standing upright. 50,000 people were watching. I laid hands on the blind woman first. I said, in the name of Jesus, I command these blind eyes to see. 
Instantly, God opened her eyes, and she ran through the audience, shouting in her own tongue, I can see! I can see! I went to the deaf mute and put my fingers in his ears and my thumb on his tongue, and I said, In the name of Jesus, I command this deaf, dumb spirit to come out. Instantly, the spirit responded, and the man started speaking English within a few minutes. He didn't know English. Okay. He didn't know his own language. <laughs> <laughs> he had been a deaf mute, but God had opened his ears and wow. loosened his tongue. That's awesome. It came time to pray for the crippled woman, and I said, Now I'm going to lay hands on this woman in the name of Muhammad. I'm going to give him equal time. My interpreter did, did not want to translate this statement. And I said, you do what I tell you to do, mister. You are my interpreter. I am the man of God. <laughs> not one person in the audience expected her to get up because they knew Muhammad was dead. I said, now, that is the difference between the God that you serve and the God I serve. I didn't come here to put your own God, your God down. I came here to lift mine up. You visit your shrine, I visit mine. But mine is empty because he's no longer here. That is the difference between the tombs. I came to let you know my Jesus is not dead. He is alive, and he is the same today as he, is, he was yesterday. So I laid hands on the woman in the name of Muhammad and said, Rise and walk in the name of Muhammad. Someone asked me what I would have done if she had gotten up. Well, I guess I would have converted. <laughs> but she didn't get up. So I said, I'm going to use the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, the lamb that was slain for the world. Jesus died for the people of India and for the whole world. The woman had never taken an upright step in 58 years. I laid hands on her in the name of Jesus and said, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. She stood upright and walked for the first time in her life because Jesus Christ is God. Do you know what happened? The people... And that crowd stumping, started jumping out of trees, and a mob came running toward me. I jumped behind my interpreter because I thought they were going to tar and feather me and run me out of the country. <laughs> and I never saw such an onslaught of people. They were yelling something at the top of their voice. I asked my interpreter, what are they saying? He said, they are hollering, Jesus is alive, Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is God. They are coming to get saved. What a thrill. Not one of them came when I preached, but when they saw the demonstration of the gospel, they came. God has called the church to demonstrate his power. Aren't you glad he is alive Amen. today? So let's talk about that one. Okay. So they had been um, talking to preaching. You know, that, that, that missionary had been preaching to these same people for 30 years. 30 years. And not one person got saved. And so R. W. Schombach goes and he preaches the same way, and not fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. You think you can get one person out of fifty thousand yeah. people? Yes, you would. But not one person came forward. But when, you know, when he took the scripture, the scripture says, you know, that that uh, signs, wonders, and miracles will follow the preaching of the word. Mm -hmm. And so when he did that, then the people. They came running up. They wanted, they wanted to see the power of God. They wanted the power of God in their own life. They wanted to serve a living God. They wanted to serve a living God. Mm -hmm. They weren't sure he was alive until they saw the power happen. And, you know, as, as faith people, we need to understand that. You know, we can give people a whole lot of words. But the words won't do it. But the demonstration and power of That's God's right. word Amen. will make a difference. Amen. It'll make a huge, huge difference. In fact, let me read this scripture. In Acts, verses 5 and 6, it says this. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So they, they don't mind hearing it, but they want to see it, you know? And, and uh, when they see it, they will respond. Amen. And so we need to do more of that. You know, I, I've fallen into a pattern, I suppose, that, you know, I preach the word and then I close it out with prayer and everybody goes home. But, you know, the Bible says that what follows the word? Signs, wonders, and miracles follow the word. Follow the word. Doesn't go before the word. Amen. It, goes, it follows the word. So when we preach the word, the word of faith, then we should be praying for people. 
Amen? We've done it before. But I mean, most of the time, we just close out a service. That's what most pastors do. That might be, if you're a pastor, that would be what you've done. But we've got to change the way we're doing things. Because people, especially right now, need to see the power of God Amen. happening. Amen? Hallelujah. Give me just one moment here. This next story is called It's Never Too Late. <clears throat> Some time ago when I was in Seattle, Washington, <clears throat> that's where our daughter lives, we're pretty close to there, I preached a message about Lazarus. The Bible says that Lazarus had been in the grave for four days when Jesus finally came. Although it seemed as if he had arrived too late, he was right on time. He is never too late. In other words, it's never too late for a miracle. No. Sometimes we put limits on God. Mary and Martha were limited in their faith. They said to Jesus, Lord, if you have just been here, my brother would not have died. They had forgotten that Jesus was Christ, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. They had forgotten that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. They didn't know that Jesus had intentionally waited. He wanted his followers to witness his miraculous power. We should never try to figure out God's timetables. He's always on time and it's never too late. After the service, a woman came to me and shoved a piece of paper into my hand. She said, now I dare you to say it's not too late. Do you know what that paper was? It was a divorce paper, a final decree. She had just received it from the judge. It was final. The husband was gone. She looked me right in the eye and said again, now I dare you to say it's not too late. So I smiled and took her dare and said, it's not too late. <laughs> she said, well, what about that paper? And I said, you are looking at the wrong paper. That's right. Thank My you. paper says, what therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Matthew 19.6. That is what I believe. How long have you been married? She told me they had been married for 27 years and had five children. I said, this man has no business leaving you. I laid hands on her and said, Holy Ghost, bring that rascal to his senses and save him. Don't bring him back home the way he is. Lord, save him and fill him with the Holy Ghost. I looked at the woman and said, get, go home and get ready for your husband. He's coming. Of course, that was easy for me to say. I was leaving town. I'm an evangelist. <laughs> I can hit them and run. <laughs> but in all honesty, I believed what I had said. My wife and I drove from Seattle to Philadelphia. When we got to Philly, I had a letter from that woman waiting for me. I opened it, and the first lines said, Dear Brother Schombach, God is never too late. <laughs> God got a hold of that rascal, <laughs> saved him, and filled him with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the Lord brought him back home, and we got married all over again. That is the powerful aspect of faith. Take a stand of faith and say, Devil, you are a liar. I'm going to believe God for a miracle because he's going to turn this situation around. Speak faith. Speak to that mountain. And that mountain has to obey your words. This is how you will experience the power of faith. So many times, faith people, you know, pray for someone that's ah, it's too late. You know, and it's never too late. It's never too late. For God. No, it's no. never too late. You know, I don't care how bad things look. You know, I, I've seen things look really, really bad at times and then seen God heal someone. I've seen, I, I was asked one time by my mom to go see a lady that was in the hospital that was full of cancer. Every organ in her body was full of cancer. And she was dying. My mom asked me, to, it was a good friend of my mom, she asked me to go, go see this woman. So I did. And uh, the first thing I did, of course, was lead her to Christ. Because to me, that's the most important thing. Amen. And uh, I mean, she's dying. She needs Christ in her life. But I was believing she was going to be healed, but I wanted to get her saved nonetheless. Because you never know. Some people just won't receive. You know, they just won't. But anyway, the long part of the story is she did receive. But I'll tell you what happened. Um, there were, I think, at that time there were like four people in a room. You know, there were a little bit of rooms, but they had four people in it. And so I started talking to her, and I, I read every, just probably every healing scripture to her and explain uh, what faith was all about and after she got born again. And and, uh, and then I prayed for her. And, uh, and you know, the, those other ones in there were kind of just wondering, too, what's going on here. But anyway, then I prayed for her. And, and then I left. 
I didn't see any outward sign that she was healed, but I prayed the prayer of faith and I left. The The next, uh, I don't know if that was, I think that was morning. Yeah. Because they were going to take her into surgery and uh, take, you know, cut out what they could. That's what they used to do a long time ago. Cut out what they could and then close them back up and wait for them to die. They usually ended up getting them another week or two. So, <laughs> so I don't know why they did that. But anyway, that's how they used to do it. Anyhow, um, I got a call later that day, I think it was. Or first thing the next day, I'm not sure. Now I don't remember, it's been too long. But it was the uh, the, head, the president of the hospital, the head of the hospital, whatever he was. And uh, he said, uh, did you come and, and uh, see a lady named, and I can't give you her name, but and I said, yes, I did. <clears throat> and they said, did you pray for her? And I said, I did. They said, we need to see you. Can you come in right now? I thought, oh boy, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> anyway, I wasn't the pastor at that time, so, you know, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> so anyway, I, I went in there, and he had a piece of paper. He said, I've got 60-some people here that want to see you. I said, why? Well, we our doctors took her in. to, to They were going to do the surgery. They decided to do another x-ray first, you know, to make sure where everything was. And she was 100% healed. She was ready to die. We didn't expect her to live very long at all. And she was healed. And the word spread through the hospital. Now there's 60-some people who want to see you. Here's the list. I expect you to go see them. <laughs> and I did. And uh, I was young at the time, you know. And, and uh, I didn't like people that didn't want Christ. I mean, I didn't want to pray for them. And so I didn't. So, you know, I said, well, let me tell you about Jesus first. I don't want Jesus. I just want to be healed. So I walked to the next person. <laughs> there were a lot of people healed that day. A lot of people Sounds should like have been healed. That weren't. <laughs> there were quite a few that weren't because I wouldn't pray for them. <laughs> I've learned the difference. You know, Jesus Christ prayed for people all the time, whether they were following him or not, and then they did follow him. So I was wrong, in case you ever thought about doing that. Anyway, um, so, you know, God does those things when people when people have no hope no chance whatsoever um, my stepdad one time we had to go and see him because we were called and he was dying and they called everybody in to say their goodbyes before he croaked and uh, I just he wasn't born again he didn't want to get born again so I wouldn't I wouldn't say goodbye to him and he said well what are you going to do and I said I'll pray for you you know and he said well okay please do that so I did and he got healed instantly they let him out of the hospital and uh, so those things happen when people are on their deathbed. It's never too late. Even if someone dies, it's not too late. So well, what if you're at a funeral? Well, it's still not too late. That's a little difficult at a funeral these days. It just takes a little greater faith. <laughs> a little greater faith. And some, bold, it's and some, pretty, and some boldness. It's the same just, faith. It's the same faith. That's right. You just got to apply it harder and believe yeah. more. <laughs> That's right. But, yeah. Anyway, there's, there's always, it's just never too late. So I'm going to read one, this one called I Died Last Night. It kind of goes along with that. So, Our tent was standing on Sunrise Boulevard. I think that's in California. Isn't it? I think so, yeah. it was one of the greatest revivals I had ever had, and a man died in the fourth row. Immediately I went to him with my Bible. I wasn't going to let the devil kill anybody in my meeting. <laughs> and I won't either. I can tell you that right now. You, don't, you do not die in my service. If you do, I'm bringing you back. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I commanded the devil to turn him loose. I called his spirit back into his body, but there were no signs of life. I told my tent crew, come and take him behind the platform. No one is going to disturb my preaching. So they took him there. Somehow we actually forgot about him. <laughs> I went to my hotel. At 3.30 in the morning, I sat straight up in bed and said, uh-oh, <laughs> oh my, the dead man. <laughs> it was the first time I had thought about the incident since it had happened. Since it happened. The next night I returned to the tent. During the meeting I asked, I want five of the happiest people here tonight to come up and tell us what you're happy about. The dead man was the first in line. I didn't recognize him. He was dressed up. I handed him the microphone and asked, what are you happy about, brother? Praise God, he replied, I died last night. <laughs> I thought, what kind of a nut do I have here? <laughs> but he looked at me in a strange way and said, don't you remember me? No, sir, I replied, I don't remember you. 
You walked through four rows of chairs to get to me, he answered. Brother Schambach, I had my fifth heart attack in your tent last night. Doctors told me if I had one more heart attack, it would kill me. My body was there, but my spirit was gone. I saw you running back through those people. You called my spirit back into my body. Tears started running down my face. I'm so thankful you did that, he said, because last night I was a sinner, and I would have gone to hell if you hadn't stopped my spirit. My spirit came back into my body, and I woke up behind that platform with a brand new heart. Hallelujah. I got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost last night. I went to my doctor today and he couldn't believe it. The man shouted, Jesus came into my heart last night and gave me a brand new heart. Hallelujah. Ooh, hallelujah. His doctor had said to him, where are the other four scars on your heart? He couldn't find the scars from the previous heart attacks. You have the heart of a 25-year-old man, he told him. Since that night, when God, when God directs me, I don't hesitate to lay hands on any dead folk because they may not be saved. I would like them to be saved, saved from the burning flames of hell. That man was on his way to hell. But thank God I got a hold of that spirit before the devil could claim him. God saved him and filled him with the Holy Ghost and, and with fire. fire. And what was the one previously? It's never God's too never late. never too late. Never too late. You know what I'm seeing here? I'm seeing another um, key element. He takes authority. He takes control over the situation. He doesn't let the situation control him. That's right. And that's the biggest problem right now. Uh, there's so much fear in the world. People are letting the fear control them. Um, no, no, no. you got to put God's word first and let him show you how to take control of the situation. Our son one time, um, our daughter and he were traveling back from college together and they had the car way overpacked. And the tire blew. And um, no doubt he was probably traveling a little fast, too. Anyways, they got off the road. The policeman um, came by and helped him, whatever. And, um, but anyways, uh, he asked him, I told him at the time, he says, you know, you, sh you should have rolled that car. And um, from everything I'd heard, they should have. So I went to him later <clears throat> um, down the road a little ways. And I asked him, I said, son, what kept you from rolling the car? How did you not do that? He says, it wasn't an option. Now, I had to put my head around that one. It took me a little bit of thinking. It isn't an option. And I thought, how many times do we let a bad situation control us? Yep. Uh, the woman with the divorce, um, God's word will give you direction all the right. way through. All the way through. He'll walk you through every situation you ever deal with. Now, you will deal with them still. But they don't have to be anything like what they turn out to be a right. great deal of the time. Amen. All right. On to the next. Well, let me, before I go on, it's miracles. Have you ever seen any miracles? I mean, I've seen lots of them. But, I mean, have you ever had a miracle in your own life? Any of you out there ever had a miracle in your own life? Hey, share it with us. You know, put it in the comment. People want to see that. People, oh, absolutely. It will help people to uh -huh. believe for their miracle. Amen. When you share a testimony of a miracle, well, Revelation um, says you overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. That's right. That's how you overcome mm -hmm. him. That's how you overcome him. By the blood of the Lamb. The more you the share it, the stronger you become. Speaking of that, next Sunday, there's going to be a powerful service. And I'm going to share some things that you might not have heard before about Revelation. So... It's not on, totally on Revelation, but it's, it's some things that are going to help us get through some of the things we're going through right now. So anyway, you might want to be there, or at least tune I in. I will be there. <laughs> yeah, you will be, obviously. I don't want to say you have to be, but it would be kind of difficult for me to lead worship without it. And by the way, if there's any worship leaders out there that have been following us for a long time, you know we need a worship leader. <laughs> we don't need a song leader. <laughs> we don't need a song leader. There's a big difference. If well, you don't know the difference... Yeah. We need a worship team. I'll bet you there's some worship teams out there that are watching online. Drummer. Yeah. Oh, we need a drummer big time. We need that consistent beat. <laughs> yeah, we really do. <laughs> I try really hard. I sometimes see people out there trying, going like this, you know. <laughs> trying to help you out. Trying to help me out so I got to Well, then why beat. don't you just make your foot tap? <laughs> I make my foot tap all the time, but not always when the same thing they're tapping. The drum helps a lot. But nevertheless, Amen. so if you're out there okay. and... You're wondering, where are, we, where are we going to be able to minister? You can minister right here. Just come see me. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. On, onward we go. 
Hospital riot in Newark. That can happen, by the way. I've been kicked out of hospitals. I before. believe that's in New York. <laughs> Newark. Newark, uh, Pennsylvania, maybe, or New York. Mm -hmm. I don't know. In, 19, Ooh, in 1960, God led me to anoint people with oil during the crusade services. Sometimes I asked them to take their shoes off so I could anoint their feet. Then I anointed their hands and their head, and I would just pour oil all over them. <laughs> Remind me to talk to that story. Okay, afterwards. In those days, I gave a bottle of oil to fired up believers and sent them out with it. Go out there and find somebody who is sick, I would tell them. Anoint them with oil so that they may be healed. That's the scriptures. Uh, in reality, oil is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. Years ago, during a crusade in Newark, I laid hands on a young man. On this particular night, I gave him a bottle of oil and spoke those same words to him. I didn't see him for a few nights. Then his best buddy came and told me, he's in jail. And I said, why is he in jail? He said, if we're listening to you. <laughs> okay. I imagine that could happen if people listen to me too much. Anyway, I, well, I, anyway, now if he was in jail because of what I had said, I wanted to go bail him out. But the Lord said, leave him alone. That is the trouble with us. We want to mess things up. Just let the Lord have his way. On the fifth night, the missing man came bouncing into our meeting. I never saw a young man on fire like he was. I prayed, Lord, if jail will do that for folks, put all these people in jail. <laughs> he was on fire. I called him to the front and gave him the microphone. I wanted to hear what he had to say. As it turned out, I didn't get to preach that night. <laughs> it can happen. He told the audience that when I gave him the oil and told him to go find someone who was sick, he didn't go home. He went to the nearest hospital. Makes sense to me. And uh, where the sick were. He didn't have a minister's card. He wasn't ordained. All he had was a bottle of oil and an edict from a preacher saying, go and find somebody who was sick. So he went to the hospital. It happened to be the largest hospital in the city. And without signing in with the nurse, he headed straight for the elevator. When he reached the 15th floor, he got the bottle of oil out and started laying hands on the sick. He told everybody he laid hands on, get up and go home. God has healed you. He cleaned out the whole floor. <laughs> Isn't that wild? <laughs> Very well. <laughs> Those hospital patients had better sense than many church folks. They were going to do what the man of God had told them to do, rise and walk. After he got rid of the patients on that floor, he went down to the 14th floor. He was planning to anoint every patient in that hospital. Can you imagine folks going out the front door in slippers, pajamas, and overcoats, and the nurses asking what they were doing? The doctor said, well, the doctor said we were healed and told us to go home. <laughs> the young man went to the next floor. He walked into a ward of about 180 people. There were five doctors working with a woman who had just passed away. The young man didn't run in. He waited until the doctors left. After the last doctor left, they pulled a sheet over the woman. He went to her and pulled the sheet back. Everybody in the ward was looking in his direction. As they watched, the young man poured oil on the woman, rebuked death in the name of Jesus. He called her spirit back into her body. Suddenly the woman sputtered about a half a dozen times, got up and out of bed. She started shouting and running around the hospital room. This, of course, isn't my story. I'm just telling you what the young man told us. It blew us away. Can you imagine the chaos that broke loose in that ward? When you go in with a bottle of oil and something like this happens, they aren't going to ask what church you represent or for your credentials. <laughs> There's a dead, dead woman jumping and screaming. Every patient on that floor was saying, Hey, bring that oil over here. If, if it will raise that woman from the dead, it will heal me. This is the reason I anoint people with oil. I want to stir up that gift in them. When you do what God has called you to do, you will have people crying out for help. There is a world out there waiting for the church to come alive. The, today is the day we can say, look out, devil. But the young man's story isn't over yet. The nurses called the police. They arrested the young man. He was charged with disturbing the peace. He was guilty. Yes, he was. He was disturbing the devil's peace. <laughs> Don't you think it's about time the church disturbs the devil's peace? <laughs> the devil has been disturbing our peace all along. Yes, he has. The authorities put him in jail and left him there for four days. The judge was aggravated when he saw the paperwork on the case. He said, why would this man be kept in for so long? He told them to go and get him out. When they brought him out, the judge apologized to him. He said, he said, your honor, don't apologize, the young man said. Jesus put me there. The judge was mystified. He said, I have heard everything blamed on him. 
but never this. He replied, <laughs> that's so true. The young man told the judge his story that I just told you. He said, Your Honor, when they arrested me, I still had some oil left. I have gone to all the prisoners and anointed them, every one of them. Just five minutes ago, the jailer got saved. You got me out just as I finished. The judge looked over his bench. Case dismissed, he said. <laughs> then he added, son, go get some more oil. God knows the church isn't doing what it's supposed called to do. Thank God there are young men being raised up to obey God. I will never forget this story as long as I live. I tell it everywhere. Some folks don't believe it, but I just figured they don't believe the Bible. So why would they believe this? <laughs> now you know why I anoint with oil. <laughs> I, uh, I've been kicked out of hospitals. Uh, when we moved, we were starting a church down in a place called uh, <laughs> Coleman. Coleman, Alabama. Mm -hmm. The last holdout probably for real bad racism. They had signs on both sides of, well, right before we bad. moved there, <laughs> uh, on both sides of the town. This is a while back. They said, if you're black, don't be here after dark. Anyway, uh, but we, we got there and we started church. So I said, well, Lord, where should I go? Where should I go? And uh, he said, the hospital. Well, you know, so I walked, the hospital wasn't that far away. I walked to the hospital. And I went in. I said, okay, Lord, where do I go from here? He said, go, you know, go up to the uh, uh, ICU. I said, that makes sense. Those people are really sick there. So I went up to the ICU. And, and there was a little uh, chapel right beside there. So I went in. And there was a book, uh, prayer requests, for people that were in the ICU. So I wrote down their names. And uh, then I walked into the ICU. I'm a pastor. I didn't have any credentials with me or anything. But I walked in there, and I just started, you know, when I started going around, and I asked, where's this person? I'd go and pray for them. And, and nobody stopped me, you know, and people were healed. I mean, miraculous things were happening in the hospital. I kept going back, going back, and, and then people started thinking that I was the chaplain. Uh, chaplain. Mm -hmm. So I got called into the principal's office, you might say, one day. He says, why, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going and praying for people. Well, you're giving us a bad name and you're giving the, the chaplain a bad name. People are getting healed and they think you're the chaplain. He says, I don't want you coming here anymore. So I got kicked out <laughs> because people were getting healed. So it does happen. It mm -hmm. does happen. Mm -hmm. And so, but, you know, we, we've got to be bold. Yes, we, we like that young man was. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. I like what the judge said. You know, well, son, go get some more oil. God knows the church isn't doing what it's called to do. Thank God there are young men being raised up to obey God. I like that. Amen. You know, the one, <laughs> and even a judge recognized, back then, obviously, some judges were Christian. There's probably still a few are. But anyway, uh, it was so good to see that, you know, someone went out and did what they were supposed mm -hmm. to do. Yes. Amen? And that's pretty good. Move on to another one here. Okay, I'm going to read one about a child. Okay? One day in New York, the Holy Ghost directed me to have a children's blessing service. A couple of days beforehand, a woman came to me and said, Brother Schambach, I have a retarded son. That's what they used to call him back then. So don't, I'm not saying anything bad. When he was born, the doctors used instruments that damaged his head. It became odd-shaped. After hearing you preach for a week, my faith has come alive. My son can't read or write. I believe that when you lay hands on him, God will perform a miracle, and he'll be able to read and write. Mm -hmm. I said, do you believe that? And she said, I believe it. Children's blessings... Children's Blessing Night came around, and I prayed for 3,000 children. Oh, my. Right on Broadway <laughs> in New York. That's awesome. I never saw so many kids in my life. Wow. I didn't know the woman's child from any other child. I lay hands at each one. That was on Friday night. On Monday, the woman came back, and I knew something had happened. The ushers were trying to get her, get her to keep quiet and stay in her seat. But I said, don't try to get her to sit down. God did something for her, and I want to hear about it. Mm -hmm. So she came up and told the folks what God had done for her son. I always got calls from his school teacher telling me that he was a hyperactive child. He was always trouble. Monday morning, I got another call from his teacher, and I said, oh, no, what did he do now? And the teacher said, oh, no, no, this is a good call. Something happened 
and we want you to know what it is. And I said, what are you talking about? What happened to my boy? She said, we don't know. <laughs> that is why we are calling you. You know that your son can't read or write. Today I gave a test to my students. Well, he picked up a pencil and decided to do the test. I corrected the papers and he got 100%. Now, can you imagine? Put yourself in that teacher's shoes. If, if that was your pupil and you saw 100% on a test from a child you knew couldn't read or write, what would you do? The teacher said, sit down, boy. You're going to take another test again at my desk. He got 100% again. She was so overwhelmed that she took him to the principal's office. The principal gave him a third test, and he got the third 100% score. That's amazing. The boy got more 100% marks in that one day than I got in my lifetime, the teacher said. Well, <laughs> she didn't do very good. If that's the anyway, uh, we want to know where you took him over the weekend. The mother said, I had him in a Holy Ghost revival, and the man of God laid hands on my son. Thank you, Lord. She brought her boy with her to the service and showed him off to the crowd. Look at this beautiful head, she said. God even changed the shape wow. of his head. Isn't that incredible? God will incredible. honor your faith. Yes. He will honor your faith. He will do what you believe him for. Yes. The woman believed God could do it. I yes. agreed with her. If two can agree on anything as touching it, it is done. Six years later, that family became members of my church. The young lad graduated from high school with honors. A boy who couldn't read and write. A boy who couldn't read and write. Isn't that amazing? That is just amazing. And so I'm telling you, God will honor your faith. And I like that. You know, sometimes we think, well, we've got to hear from God first. The Bible tells us that it's the will of God to, to heal. heal. And there's a lot of other things that are the will of God. You don't have to get a word from God to find out if he wants you to pray for someone. The Bible says it's the will of God. You just need to do it. And if you say something and you're backing it up with the word, you don't even... It's going to happen. God will be there. The Bible says, you know, that he, he um, is there to perform his word. And he will perform his word. Mm -hmm. You know, so you don't have to worry whether God's power is going to be there. It will be. you just got to have faith and no doubt, no doubt at all. And just do what you know in your spirit you should do. And you're going to see miracles, signs, That's and right. wonders. In your own life as well as others. The biggest problem, most people can get it, some people can get it for others, most people can't. Some people can get it for others, but they can never get it for themselves. You should be able to get healing for yourself Absolutely. first, mm -hmm. be first before you can get healing for anybody else. I truly believe that. I've said that all my life, but it doesn't usually happen. But it does happen for us, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it should happen for you. Amen? <clears throat> Practice on yourself. Mm -hmm. you, you get a symptom of, I don't care if it's a cold. Come against it. Come against it with the word of God. Come against it with your authority. Come against it. Lay hands on yourself. Anoint yourself with oil if you need to. But believe for healing. And you'll get it. It happens all the time for us. I mean, you think the devil doesn't come after preachers? He comes after preachers sure all does. the time. And, uh, but we don't just accept it. We come against it. We believe for healing and we get it. And, and that's what you just need to know. You'll get it. You know, and... Uh, now some people say, well, yeah, I'm a pastor. You just had a heart attack. Yeah. But I didn't die. And I got out. On a heart attack. They said he should have died from Yeah, it. they said I should have died from it, especially how long it took mm -hmm. to get, get me there. And, uh, but I did not. You know, and I kept telling everybody, including people in the ambulance, I'm going to live and not die. The Word of God says I'm going to live and die, not die. And I'm going to live and not die and continue to preach the Word of God. Amen. And... Uh, I intend to be totally healed from this, and I commanded my blood vessels to work right, my heart to work right. Mm -hmm. Did that all the way up there. Mm -hmm. And when I got out of the hospital, they said, you're the healthiest heart patient we've ever had. <laughs> and they're telling me the same thing up at cardiac rehab now, you know, that I'm doing better than anybody. I mean, I'm, I, I'm running on the treadmill. Uh, they didn't want me to run on the treadmill, but I've been running on the treadmill. And, and you know, I'm doing really good. I mean, my blood pressure is better than it's ever been. And, you know... I believe for healing, and I got healed. Yeah, the devil comes against you, but you don't have to accept no, you it. Don't. You do not have to accept it. And uh, people accept things too quickly, too quickly, you know. And uh, you know they they get uh, right now because of all this fear out there about this Delta variant, which you know is it's it's not a big deal, people. Not a big deal. 
I, I'm not even sure it wasn't made up. But even if it was, it's not a big deal. We heard a doctor say that, um, you know, the Delta variant is about half the strength of the COVID. And COVID, you know, even a 90-year-old person has a 98.9% .9 chance of surviving the COVID if he gets it. I mean, think about that. I mean, people at my age, and I'm, I'm 66, so people my age and up have a 99.8% chance of surviving. I mean, think about that. Kids, they're going to survive it. That's why they trip a mask on all these kids going to school, and they survive it 100% pretty much. I mean, it's rare for any any kid to ever die. And and so, I mean, this fear is causing people to, as soon as they have a symptom, run to the hospital or run to the doctor. Wrong thing to do. Run to the Word. Run to the Word. Don't just start thinking, oh, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. You're not going to die. You've got a better chance, of a whole lot better chance of living than dying without any miraculous intervention. But with God's intervention, there's no way you're going to die. The first thing that happens is you get a symptom. And whatever it is, you don't, if, if you've got family uh, history, your symptom may be one of the family history things that runs in your family bloodline. And um, it doesn't matter what the symptom is. You get a symptom, you get a thought. Your thought tells you it's you're getting whatever. Um, you can pick literally anything. Now, at that point, you don't have it. You've got a symptom and a thought. It's what you do next that determines whether you get it or not. If you take the Word of God and stand on it, you and fight it, eventually that symptom and that thought will leave. Because what you do is you speak the word of God, you cast down the thought. You speak the word of God, and the symptom has to leave. Because nothing has more authority than the word of God. Second Corinthians 10, mm -hmm. 4 and 5 says, you know, we wrestle, you know, we don't, we don't fight like other other. We're not, we don't fight according to the flesh, right? Mm -hmm. It says, uh, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty go. through God, there to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every thought imagination. and imagination that exalts itself mm -hmm. against the Word of God. Yeah. You know, every, every imagination that brings itself against the Word of God and bringing into captivity every thought. That's right. If you don't speak those thoughts out, you've taken control of your mind and you've taken control of that situation. The moment you let it come out of your mouth and you say, oh no, I think I have this. Well, you may as well go start making plans to die. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, not necessarily <laughs> die. It just depends on what you're dealing depends with. Depends on what you're dealing with. Right. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't have but said that. But the moment hurts. you say, I think I'm getting, you are getting. You're going to get it. Your symptoms get stronger because they're taking hold on you. Uh, your symptoms get stronger. The thoughts get more determined. Yep. But, so it's up to you which way you're going to go. And colds to me were extremely easy to get rid of after I'd suffered with them for many years. But as I started hearing this teaching, I thought, you know, I don't want to deal with colds. So I put colds, flus, and viruses together in a package yep. in my mind. Why? Because they're all germ-related. So now I place the hedge of divine protection around me according to God's word. According to his word, I can do that. So as I place the hedge around me, I would see germs still get on me the way they do anyone else. You're in a store, you touch a shopping cart, there's a germ on it, it gets on you. But I saw them now falling off and dying. That's right. Why? Because I got a hedge of divine protection that comes from God. Not from me. My belief allows it to work. It's from God. And he protects me. That's right. Like I said earlier, Romans 8.11 says that the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. Mm -hmm. And let me just stop there for a second. If he dwells in you, if the Holy Spirit's inside of you, you think the Holy Spirit can get sick? No. <laughs> you think Jesus gets sick? You know, someone, someone was saying the other day, well, maybe a few months ago, I don't know, said if Jesus was here, he'd get the vaccine. <laughs> That's no, the dumbest wouldn't. thing I've ever heard. <laughs> he doesn't get sick. He's God. And if you got God inside of you, you can't get sick. Think about it for a moment. If the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then that same spirit that rose Jesus will also quicken or make alive your mortal flesh. Those germs 
will die. Amen. We were talking about R.W. Schombach, but there's another one uh, that, uh, what was his name? Okay, it's Kenyon. Yeah, I'm thinking of Kenyon who wrote um, Christ the Healer. I don't know if it was him. Uh, you don't think it was him? Okay, uh, I'll look up real quick. Well, anyway, uh, this, another one of the generals of God, and I'll think of his name in a little bit. But anyway, it was during the Black Plague. And, um, oh, you're thinking of something different. Yeah, and so he, people were dying right and left. Normal and, Hayes, you're thinking of. No, I'm not thinking of Normal Hayes. No? Nope. Normal Hayes went around <laughs> there. All right. Okay. So anyway, uh, but he... he uh, oh, my phone's almost dead. <laughs> anyway, he w decided to go out and bury people, uh, trying to help out because they didn't have enough people to bury. Oh. People were dying so fast. Millions of people dying. I know his name. And uh, so, you know, if you, if you got anywhere near somebody that had this, you got it and died. And he was, he was picking these people up, carrying them, putting them in graves, and he was getting their saliva on him. And the doctors showed up with all their equipment on and said, what are you doing? You know, I'm just helping people bury. He says, why haven't you got something, some, some protection on to keep yourself from getting this? You're going to die. And he said, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Well, what's your protection? He said, let me tell you. And he says, and he quoted Romans 8, 11, saying, if the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in me, then... That same spirit will also quick my mortal body and will kill every germ that touches me. He says, and I'll prove it. So he went and he got some of that, that stuff of somebody who just died, put it in his hand. He says, take your microscope and see if there's germs on it. No, he said, no, no. He says, take those and look at the germs first, you know, before they could put it in his hand. And, and if they're alive, he said, yeah. So he grabbed it, put it in his hand, now look at it. And every germ died instantly mm -hmm. because that's what happens when you got the Holy Ghost inside of you? He can't get sick. And you can't get sick if you got the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of you. That's an incredible, incredible uh, thing. If you start believing that. Amen. Sorry, I can't remember who uh, it is. I'll think of him. Uh, who I was can't it? remember. I heard this story. We, we've though. told the story so many times that I should know it. If I wasn't yes, looking at R.W. Schombach, I might remember. <laughs> it wasn't A.A. A. Allen. It was uh, somebody in between them. In fact, in fact R.W. Schombach Learned everything he learned from A.A. A. Allen, by the way. Oh, yeah. and, uh, but anyway, it, it doesn't matter who did it. The fact is, it works. Mm -hmm. Germs die, just like Cindy was saying. Germs die when you they touch us. you got to visualize it. you got to visualize how the Word of God works for you, how it, how it has authority, how it uh, takes, takes authority. Yep. Praise the Lord. Well, anyway... Uh, R.W. Schombach, one of the generals that learned about faith, and he taught faith. You know, a lot of people think Kenneth Hagin was the first one to teach faith, you know, but no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He taught faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, an awesome, awesome man of God. Amen. And, and you can be the same way. You know, these were one person, you know, this time, and he'd go around and make a difference in the world. Then another one person would come up like Kenneth Hagin did, and so on. And you can be that one person. You can change somebody's life. They might die without you. But with you, they can live and not die. Amen? And so, you have a job to do. Yes, you do. You have a job to do. You've been listening to this. You've been growing in faith. You have a job to do. And it's time the church got up and did the job the church was called to do. Amen? And it's time for some of you to get back in the church. Amen? Because they're going to try to start closing down churches soon mm -hmm. again. It's not going to happen here. We won't close it down. No. But uh, some of you might want to run. Have you tempted to run again? Get in church and let the Holy Ghost just get a hold of you big time and start doing the things God's called you to do. God bless you all for watching today. Uh, spread this word. Share this message. Amen. Share the message. Let's get it out there and let people yeah. figure this out. That they need to trust in God and his word. Mm -hmm. Not in the government to, to do anything for them. The government is not the one that's supposed to do everything for you. Not really, if you really read the word, not even your social services, you know. Not even, you know, paying for your 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 health insurance or all that. I mean, God, you don't need health insurance if you've got God, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't have it, but I'm saying God can heal you of everything. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word tonight. We're so thankful for the, the great things that R.W. Schombach was able to do, Lord, through you and through your word. We thank you, Lord, that 
You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you will honor your word no matter which one of us stand up and proclaim it. We thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you this week. Amen. And I pray that you'll have a lot of divine divine appointments. Yes. Have a good week, folks.